So good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see some old friends here. And uh, also, I want to express my gratitude, especially to the residents who have been fully uh, engaged in um, the preparation for the many guests who are coming from around the world to sit Rohatsu. As Noah shared, um, I suddenly was tapped at the last minute to uh, give a talk tonight. So I put together some thoughts, but when um, my good friend, our good friend, uh, Sensei Kazuaki Tanahashi arrived um, and was informally uh, presenting me with a scroll or upaya with a very, very precious scroll I asked him if he would mind making that presentation formal here in the Zendo. Um, it's a, a, a rare gift from um, two extraordinary artists. Uh, the calligrapher who was uh, the abbot before last uh, of Eheji Monastery and um, the scroll maker Yoshimura from Nara, who happened to have this calligraphy and um, made a beautiful scroll, I am sure, uh, from the silks that um, his family and for generations have accumulated as master scroll makers. And he's the last in his line, as Kaz uh, knows and as was shared with me. Um, and as such, uh, and because I, I feel so humbled to receive a gift on behalf of the Zen Center of this magnitude, uh, I wanted to share it on this evening. Um, and this evening, it was to be uh, a talk by our good friend Sensei Ulrika Greenway, who will be our visiting teacher once she gets better but she's ill right now. So uh, wishing her uh, a good recovery. I, I almost said speedy, um, but we have enough speediness in our world today. So Kazu, can you uh, come up and... He, he, yeah, but I'll, I'll put the mic on him or toward him. I think he's got it. Yeah, I need some help. Now you need to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Doesn't want to come up. This is very good. And Kaz, I think you did the calligraphy on the front. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would like to uh, translate that for us. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'll read it. Okay. Yehei Sanshu. Kumazawa Taizen Geika Okseki Yushimura Shosaku Shi Zo. But in the, in the back, I put the English. Oh, thank you so much. Here, would you share that with us too? So, Sai Kitsho, most auspicious. That's the meaning of the calligraphy by 
大前熊沢禅師、um, 1873 to 1968, the 73rd Abbot of Eheji, a gift of Mr. Shosaku Yoshimura, Uda City, Nara Prefecture, Japan. Thank you so much for also doing the beautiful calligraphy on the box. And you can't smell it, but I can.、Mm. The perfume, which is protective of the scroll,、mm. is really、mm. strong and beautiful. Could you once again translate the main part of the calligraphy? Most auspicious. Auspicious is the mountain name of Eheji,、um, Kichijo Zan Eheji. So,、uh, auspicious mountain, eternal peace, monastery. So, and then、um, Mr. Yoshimura did not know that. So I said, oh, this. And he said,、uh, well, I've been kind of、uh, treasuring it. But I should not keep it myself. So,、uh, can, you, can you have it? So I said, I'll be happy to receive it. But I will not keep it for myself. And then I will、uh, bring it as a gift, as your gift, to a temple so that many people can enjoy. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Yoshimura is a good friend of Roshi John and、uh, some of us. So, this is an obvious place to go to.、Yeah. Thank you, Kaz, so much. Wendy La, would you over here? Kaz, thank you. So,、uh, Sensei, on behalf of our Mahasangha, our community, we just want to thank you for bringing this treasure to Upaya. And also for your many, many gifts over the years.、Um, your touch is everywhere, even、uh, in this、uh, Zendo. Um, where、uh, the sense of、um, place and also the kind of rawness of place, not you know, kind of an overdone, super polished、uh, place of practice, but a place of practice that you feel the natural wood, you feel the natural clay on the walls. And this also points toward、um, the quality. Of heart and mind that we're endeavoring to cultivate and sit like a mountain, indeed. 
The theme of Rohatsu uh, every year is set by cause. I, I never know where we're going to go. And it's one of those uh, very amusing moments uh, at the end of uh, Rohatsu. Uh, Enkyo Roshi and I say, well, Kaz, uh, what shall we um, focus on uh, next year? And I always have to smile because uh, Kaz is 90 and Enkyo Roshi and I are 81. So even the thought of next year is kind of interesting. It's a kind of optimistic uh, appraisal uh, in terms of uh, impermanence that we might be here or not, uh, but I, I hope so. So at the end of last year, where we had a quite wonderful and uh, intimate Rohatsu, just slowly, slowly opening um, and then kind of shutting down again, you notice that um, the residents are in masks and Kaz and I are, are in masks. I'm really trying to be uh, very conscientious about what's happening in our world today, including the season of flu, COVID, RSV, and everything. Um, at the same time, in a world that is really deeply imperiled. And uh, as just as uh, I watching uh, the news about what is happening in Ukraine or what is happening in Gaza and Israel, Part of me uh, really um, hopes for a breakthrough, a phase shift, you know, a very fundamental uh, end to um, this habit of war, which is not only happening in landscapes, but also within our own mind, within our own heart. And it is such a profound uh, challenge to not be grabbed by the spirit of the time, which is engaged in extreme polarization, but to practice uh, this seventh factor of awakening, so to speak, um, also the fourth Brahma Vihara, uh, equanimity, which doesn't mean passivity in the midst, or indifference in the midst. I particularly appreciate Thich Nhat Hanh's translation of equanimity. And his translation is very radical, but it is brilliant, I believe. And the word that he uses to describe equanimity is the word inclusion. <laughs> Just sit with that for a minute. Inclusion. We say, roll everything into your practice. Turn away from nothing. Practicing radical inclusion from Thai's point of view is this expression of the deepest experience of what it means to stay balanced in the midst of conditions, including all conditions, into your experience of this very moment, mind. I thought it's so curious that Kaz suggested breakthrough um, because in a way the theme that he articulated in uh, Enlightenment Unfolds, <laughs> that beautiful collection of uh, teachings by Ehe Dogen, really is a little bit opposite of breakthrough. But it's also, as if you have read the introduction, you realize both breakthrough and um, unfolding are in the same court. And I called this talk tonight really uh, out of a reading uh, more deeply into uh, the work of Kitaro Nishida, 
who was the founder of the Kyoto School and who was a very close friend and actually a schoolmate of all things of D.T. Suzuki. And I was very uh, moved as uh, Nishida's own realization or wisdom or understanding um, as he was setting forth this Kyoto School of Philosophy um, as his own kind of uh, marginal practice, but in the spirit of practice. Uh, near the end of uh, his life, he used the phrase seeing without a seer, hearing without one who hears. It's a very uh, powerful way to describe this unfiltered, unmediated experience of resting simply in the sense fields and also in the mind, per se, without opinions, thoughts, and all kinds of mediating phenomena, including trying to get somewhere, uh, interfering with the experience of intimacy, of um, directness in uh, the field of practice and of the field of life, being with. And I think Tai captured this sensibility, and I often cite this example, uh, and I just want to uh, recall this example one more time. And it is um, this talk that he gave at uh, Omega, where Rodney King had been horribly beaten by the police in Los Angeles. And Ty uh, said in front of all of us there, hundreds of us, I didn't want to come to your country. And you know, I understand that. Um, I actually don't want to come to my country sometimes too. If I can be so bad as to say that. Uh, I, I cannot believe the, the incredible tangle we are in. Was it an, ever any different? I don't know. Probably Mark knows <laughs> as someone who uh, tracks the great suffering in our Western world as a, you know, as a lawyer for those on death row. Uh, someone who has stood in the way of uh, the death penalty for your whole life, really. I'm grateful to see you and Anne, by the way. So how do we cultivate the, the causes and the conditions where the possibility of either unfolding or breakthrough can happen? And I know this is this dumb joke, but anyway, this is, uh, you know, I've heard this from many Zen teachers. They say, oh yeah, enlightenment is an accident. Practice makes you accident prone. And I actually agree with that silliness um, because sometimes uh, our very ambition, our grasping, our desire, our pushing becomes the very obstacle that prevents us from just dropping into a very open state, resting in our sense fields, being with things as they are, having the stillness of our internal experience where the phenomenal world can appear as this interconnected field of process, not product. Now in early Buddhism, uh, there are uh, very wonderful teachings apparently by the Buddha although, of course, the teachings were written hundreds of years after the Buddha experienced uh, uh, his uh, dropping away of body-mind, literally. And one of those teachings um, uh, that I think are really interesting for us to um, touch into um, is referred to the inner wealth that we can access in the experience of practice that leads to breakthrough or is the experience of awakening per se. 
And these are known as the seven factors of awakening. And I just want to briefly touch into those because this is in a way how we practice. But we also, in the how we practice, we bring in uh, another feature, which I'll, I'll point to shortly. So this first factor is the, the factor or the process or the experience of smirti or nen or mindfulness. You know, what is it to be deeply in touch with this moment as it is? You know, as Noah put the, the mic on me in that kind of uh, carefulness, or as Kaz opened the box where the calligraphy was, the scroll was, and how he unfurled the scroll, that, that kind of mindfulness uh, that um, allows us, again, this deep experience of intimacy, of connection with things just as they are without judgment, without grasping. And it's such a, a radical uh, notion and process um, because it allows us to move out of this kind of process of rumination and self-centeredness that you know, envelops uh, so much of our daily experience. It's like yaddy, 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 so to speak, the constant undermutter um, that accompanies our daily activities that uh, takes us away, really, from each other. And that undermutter, in a certain way, is conditioned by uh, our attention economy, so to speak. In other words, we are left in a certain way as we're working in the digital format with a quality of attention that's deeply fragmented and that disallows the experience of intimacy, of fundamental connection. So in a way, practice is really swimming upstream. As the Buddha said, my dharma is swimming upstream. Boy, we are upstream of powerful forces, including the corporate world that are driving um, the so-called attention economy away from connection, away from intimacy, and away from each other. This uh, second factor is um, uh, wonderful because it, it usually, the term used for it is usually something like investigation, but there's, in that term, uh, investigation, there's a kind of, you know, self in there investigating stuff. And um, I prefer, actually, the term for this second factor uh, of curiosity. Not being curious in the sense of acquiring something, but actually as a state of mind, you know, resting in this kind of not knowing, in this experience of fundamental openness, you know, willing to be surprised, living in the truth of radical uncertainty. We don't really know what's going to happen, but looking deeply into the roots of our experience. And as such, um, coming into a relationship with the truth of impermanence. This fundamental experience of slipperiness in our moment-to-moment -moment lived experience. And also that looking deeply or being curious, allowing us this moment to understand it's not all about me, that the causes and conditions of my so-called subjectivity are related to the boundless interconnections, relationality, between all beings and things, including the four elements, the very air that we breathe, the earth that we're standing on, and so forth. So it's this kind of fundamental openness, but this sort of insight 
not about accumulating uh, religious opinions per se, but really about resting in the experience of constant change. And also no separate self. This is a tough one for Western people or Western educated people because we try to fix things in time because it makes us feel secure. And we also have this very deep sense of personal subjectivity. And yet, that's a fabricated construct. If we look really deeply, we'll see there is nothing that isn't subject to change. There's no moment that doesn't have change as its primary process. There is nothing that has a separate self-identity. I mean, look deeply. Every breath that you take brings you in relationship to the entity we call our atmosphere. And those that produce our atmosphere, including those who destroy our atmosphere. So it's this experience of through our curiosity or looking deeply to see the truth of impermanence and not think that we can know what the next moment will offer and that we are not separate from any being or thing. So this uh, next factor leading to, but also exemplified by, is that of wholeheartedness, virya, energy, determination. You know, it's funny, I ask someone about a, some process or thing that I said, you know, uh, how did you actually do this? And this person said to me, well, actually, I, I realize I've been rather passive. So this is a very interesting factor of enlightenment because on the one hand, it has to do with us you know, saturated by um, the uh, deep intention to, from the Mahayana perspective, um, to wake up so we can really serve others, so we can be of benefit in this world, give ourselves wholeheartedly. You know, we, when we chant the night chant, we say life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. Let us awaken, awaken. Do not squander your life. So it's a very, for me, very interesting uh, process that we engage in, in this sort of energy or determination or enthusiasm or wholeheartedness. In other words, it's this capacity to um, offer our attention to whatever we are doing in a non-resistant, open, way that is characterized by the first paramita, the paramita of generosity. Do you know, we do things half-heartedly. It's kind of an impoverished approach to things. And I remember my wonderful teacher, Glassman Roshi, saying, do not cultivate a mind of poverty in yourself or others. And it's that sense of lack of wholeheartedness or sort of personal poverty um, that disallows um, us to express completeness and thoroughness and really care in relation to all things. Wholehearted 
So when we chant, it's wholeheartedly chanting. Or when we bow, it's fully bowing. Or this place would not have come into being without wholeheartedness. Or this wonderful building next door, four years. Oh boy, wholeheartedness. Finally, we're seeing a little bit the end in sight where we did get our C of O, by the way, on Monday. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that was uh, a close call, so to speak. Thank you, Buddha. So it's just, it's the wholeheartedness. And when you see folks just sort of, you know, um, that is, it's not about aggression or ambition. Please understand, wholeheartedness isn't about crossing your legs and hoping to die entirely. <laughs> um, wholeheartedness is just being fully right in it with an absence of aggression, an absence of grasping. And I would say from uh, Dogen's perspective, which we'll hear on Friday night, cause I'm sure we'll speak to it, wholeheartedness uh, characterized by ease and joy. That's really radical. Wholeheartedness characterized by ease enjoy. I think one of the most wonderful things, um, this is our 33rd Rohatsu session coming up. And to uh, see Kaz at the age of 90 sitting every period like a giant, just still with this kind of ease and joy, it's very humbling. You know, he's, you're only 10 years older than me. So, but I look at you and I think, wow, that's, I want, I want to live in the way that you do, which is wholeheartedly. And at his 90th birthday, I made a kind of joke about Kaz because one of the things is you should never let Kaz near any project you're doing because he will have an impossible idea which he will ask you to execute. And um, he never takes no for an answer. So I appreciate your trust in uh, our wholeheartedness. So the next, uh, next factor or process of awakening is of joy. And that is really um, important. It means by joy, there's uh, a way that it's defined in, in uh, certain uh, commentaries. It's an absence of pessimism. It's an absence of futility. And by using that perspective, it becomes interesting. It's like, if you pull away the sort of ego-based gnawing sense of futility or pessimism, you know, of sinking mind, so to speak, you, you pull that away, what's underneath in our natural condition, our natural mind is in fact joy. And so this process that we're engaged in, as we sit in the charnel grounds, of our world, you know, I'm, I, I'm not uh, overdosing on what's happening in the Middle East and Ukraine. In other words, you know, I'm uh, titrating my uh, consumption level of the news, which is really important because I actually don't want in my store consciousness um, to have such uh, violence and negativity. So I'm very mindful. It's the fifth precept, basically, the consumption of toxins. On the other hand, um, you need to actually consume poison in the right dose. Only you can know what the right dose is. 
So it is the dose that allows you to see the four noble truths, so to speak, the truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, the possibility of awakening completely in the path to freedom. And as such then allowing for what breakthrough leads to, which is not a sort of ego, maniacal, you know, inside I'm enlightened kind of problem, but actually to um, uncovering uh, the quality of a profound appreciation, gratefulness, and f- fundamental and most natural joy in our experience. And I remember sitting in um, Rohatsu's uh, over the many years. I, my first real Zen retreat was only in 1975. And it's kind of funny. I, I was sure when I went in to see the Zen master and engage in Dharma combat that I would have a breakthrough. But it was more like a breakdown, actually. And then um, as practice began to uh, take over my life, um, there were many small uh, breakthroughs, if you will. Um, So it had both this quality of unfolding through time, and then every once in a while something kind of splendid would open up. But in our school, we don't go around sharing um, our breakthroughs, so to speak. We more are likely to share our, our breakdowns. Joy is really important in this practice. Dogen emphasizes it. Uh, Glassman Roshi uh, always put on that red nose to just poke us out of. Um, our heaviness, our deep compulsion to uh, bring aggression toward ourselves in our own experience of identity. And that nose uh, became for me, actually he died in a way of cancer of the nose, ironically, but you know, what, he, what Bernie tried to do in, this, in two very interesting geographies, one was the geography of charnel ground practice. And whether it was sitting in Auschwitz or with homeless people or going to Rwanda, for me, it's been over the years, the nomads clinic or sitting at the bedside with dying people. Always Bernie um, in the midst of that experience in Auschwitz, at a certain point as he sat there very quiet, bearing witness to all of the reactions that many of us experienced. And I'm so glad that Kaz and I were able over several years to sit with Bernie in Auschwitz. And always in the midst of this, he would pull out a nose, that red nose, and I'd, you know, roll my eyeballs. But it was like, can we understand the magnitude of ignorance and suffering in such an environment? And can we also make not light of things, but find the light of understanding? in this charnel ground practice. And I remember at the end of uh, one of these bearing witness retreats in Auschwitz, uh, Peter Matheson and I were standing together in the dining room and Rabbi Don Singer had brought out the shofar and was just blasting it and, and all this joyful music was going on and it was like people were dancing and the whole thing was like wow out of a Fellini movie and Peter turned to me and he said it's wonderful how people can actually express joy in the midst of such a horrible history not out of disrespect 
but really out of liberation, the commitment to end violence, even though violence continues. It's very, very powerful. The next factor is one of ease. And I often think in this regard of uh, Uchiyama Roshi, of opening the hand of thought, of not being in this experience of, of grasping, of clinging, of trying to hold on to things, but to actually have this quality of like, curiosity, basic openness, without having the judgmental thoughts or as Bernie would say, it's just your opinion, man, mediating this moment as it is. And a sense that he often manifested, as I said, in this experience of sitting in Auschwitz, where there was huge polarization, where Israelis were saying to Germans, I hate your language. I never want to hear your language, and so on and to have this quality of uh, profound presence, ease in the midst of incredible conflict, how to actually ride like the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara on the waves of birth and death without drowning in the waters of birth and death. So as we've uh, danced in this very complicated post-pandemic time, very odd, one of the things that has really meant so much to me is the practice mind of nimbleness. I look at Chuck and Nanette Monchen the practice heart-mind of nimbleness, being with whatever is arising in the moment, being able to state shift, to shift direction, to shift course based on the causes and conditions of the present moment. And that it takes some guts, I will tell you. But I want to just say, um, this is where practice really shows through. Your capacity to actually meet the unpredictability, the radical uncertainty of this moment as it is. So this uh, sixth factor that, uh, oops, sorry. I only have five more pages to go. <laughs> I won't do it. But the sixth factor is of concentration. You know, it's our ability to be absolutely present and unwavering in how we give our attention to things as they are. And the seventh factor is of equanimity. And as I said to begin this uh, talk on the factors, equanimity as translated by cause, which I think is so beautiful, is inclusion. It's including Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, Rodney King and the police. It's including the most harmful moments, not turning away from them, and also the joy. So I want to uh, thank you for uh, the chance to just share this perspective in the uh, early teachings of the Buddha, and also to just end with um, the 
uh, observation that um, the Mahayana perspective brought a whole other valence in, but that's for another chapter. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank <laughs> you.